test hypotheses at different scales and across the critical zone network. And you can sort of see how the postdoc idea fits into some of this because with the hydrologic partitioning at least, we'll are, we will already be working our way through each of these. Um, okay, so the next slide. Um, the strategies are to develop and begin using common measurements. This is something that uh, Jen McIntosh and John Shorever have worked on. Uh, Sally Thompson uh, has been helping us engage other uh, data platforms such as Quasi about the data protocols. Tess Russo here at Penn State uh, was trying to just even get a list of all the models that are in use across the network. And then Praveen is trying to uh, work on implementing an, an efficient and effective method to train people uh, in terms of models, data management, and measurements. So uh, let's go, let's look at this first key strategy. Um, here's some of the activities. John Chirover put together a white paper and it's been updated and it's available on our website. Uh, we have a very large matrix uh, that uh, shows what measurements are in place across the, across the network. We're always trying to get it updated, which means that Tim is trying to get every PI to log in and we have six out of nine. So if you're one of the three, we have to we get some we need some help from you. We'd like to make the matrix live and clickable. And so John Chorover and Tim White are working on that. Um, we actually have some cross CZO working groups that are actively working and moving uh, forward on their cross CZO topics. So for example, uh, there's a special issue on concentration versus discharge. And uh, papers are due next week for a special issue issue in Water Rock, no, Water Resources Research. And uh, John Trover, I think, is spearheading that. Um, and this will be a set of papers that clearly will highlight some common measurements. Um, other big cross CZO common efforts that have occurred for various reasons are the geophysical surveys, and I have a slide on that coming up. Um, deep drilling, where um, as many CZOs as possible. We're, we're drilling, uh, drilling the ridge in particular to, to look at uh, chemistry versus depth. And uh, we've talked about a campaign style workshop to implement common measurements, and that's in early planning stages. This is uh, the promised slide about geophysical surveys. This is a slide from YKEG, which is the Wyoming Center for Environmental Hyd Hydrology and Geophysics. And uh, the money for YKEG from EPSCOR funding uh, to Steve Holbrook and a group of, of uh, scientists at University of Wyoming. And they've gone across to many of the CZOs and uh, done a whole variety of geophysical measurements. And this model, namely uh, making the same measurements across many of the CZOs, uh, perhaps by one investigator or a group of investigators, has been wildly successful. And we'd like to promote this as well. This is the spreadsheet that John Chorover and Jen McIntosh have been working on that shows the different measurements, uh, the labels on the rows, and then um, scientific questions across the top. And then you can also uh, figure out from a version of this spreadsheet, I don't know if it's this one, which CZOs have, have these, uh, have these uh, particular measurements. Okay, so the second one, engage with other data platforms. Uh, Sally Thompson has been working towards this. Um, organizing our data is a huge, is a huge issue. Um, this is a very difficult thing. We're basically trying to measure everything that we can think of that's important in a piece of the landscape. And everybody has different protocols in different disciplines. Uh, so getting individual disciplines organized to organize their data is just very, very difficult. And we feel like made lots of progress, although it's such a hard problem that we haven't made as much progress as we would like. Uh, we are, Sally Thompson has been working to investigate whether we should be uh, working more closely with Quasi, with HIS. Uh, this is particularly suitable for time series data. Uh, they would host the data, you can help us with metadata. And so this is something that uh, many of the CZOs are already uh, utilizing and have worked uh, pretty far on, but it's particular for time series data. This just shows you 
Uh, there are tools that Quasi has built that, to pull out the data, Hydro Desktop and then Hydro Client, uh, some of us have used quite a bit. Um, we are working a lot to figure out how to move forward. Individual CZO data managers already work with HIS, with Quasi. Uh, we need to explore reliability and user friendliness, but we also recognize that um, there are other issues around non-time series data. Okay, so now I'm going on to the third one, identify, prioritize uh, the different models, and Tess Russo has been working on this. Um, I, I didn't have the right one turned red on that last slide, sorry about that. So we're now talking about the, the models. And Tess Russo has been working pretty hard just to figure out what models are out there. And of course, she started with conceptual models, and you can, you can see different types of, of models and different systems that were modeled. And... Uh, even just starting to collate this and figure out who's using what conceptual models is, is kind of helpful, or is helpful. So the next slide, uh, here's more of the different models that have been uh, in use. Um, and you can see the various uh, topics. And then all the way over on the right is the listing of which of the, uh, of the CZOs is using them. Here's some of the PIM models, which um, are used here at, at uh, uh, shale hills at any rate that's a first effort to pull models together that are in use and uh, you'll see later well i guess right here with this with this uh, um, bullet point praveen has been thinking about how to implement an efficient and effective way to train people to use the models um, and to use the data management protocols and the measurements and praveen uh, at the IML, conducted a modeling summer institute. Uh, this was quite successful in getting students uh, from different CZOs and from outside of CZO. Uh, Shale Hills also did a, a modeling workshop this year. We're actively thinking about how these workshops should proceed and could proceed. Uh, you can see the information about the IML uh, CZO and uh, how, what it exposed the students to, and then you can see some of the pictures from people uh, really from, from various CZOs and around the world. Uh, data management uh, is a piece of this and uh, Praveen has also been working to try to help us figure out how we're gonna be moving forward. Uh, Anthony Afton Comp's team has worked very hard on some of the data aspects. Uh, he's, he's not funded currently, but he's talking to NSF about uh, future funding uh, at the same time, our data managers within CZO are, are now meeting regularly, discussing long-term strategies, and uh, Praveen, in particular, is looking at ways that, propose, that, that uh, we could lead proposals to really create longevity for the CZO data. Uh, I think data is one of the most difficult pieces of, of what we're trying to do, and we are actively working uh, within the network to improve our data management and also uh, working with others outside the outside of the network. Okay, so goal three, increase awareness of and participation in critical zone science and network activities. This gets at our, at our, our uh, desire to be an open and inclusive community. Um, and we're always encouraging NSF to put money on the table to bring people in into CZO that, who are not funded now. Uh, some of the CZOs have had uh, seed grants, but in particular in goal three, we try to think about how to open uh, and make, our, make ourselves more inclusive, uh, even if NSF doesn't put new money on the table. So here's the desired results, and I'll, I'll kind of go through these. Um, a lot of this work um, has been fostered by, I think if you hit the next slide and then hit the next one again, a lot of this has been fostered by uh, the people's names here, Tim White, Lou Derry, Dan Richter. Um, and so I was gonna talk about this, but there's really been a huge amount of effort here. Uh, it's really been a flowering in terms of our education and outreach personnel. And I think it's uh, in a big way attributable mostly to work coming out of the national office. So in particular, Tim, whose name is up here many times. So you can see what we're trying to do. We're trying to leverage the national office uh, the ENO people that we have uh, to support activities uh, across the whole network. We're trying to strengthen and engage the network uh, working group. 
uh, so that the different CZOs are sharing what they're doing in ENO. We're trying to enhance the national website. Uh, there's a desire to publish an overview white paper um, that articulates a vision between CZO, LTR, and NEON. Uh, Dan Richter is, is pushing that. And then uh, Tim has been pushing to complete some revisions on an Integrate course, which is an undergraduate introduction to CZ science, and get that out um, on the website as well. So the next couple slides are going to go through some details about that. Here's some of the major achievements for ENO. Um, they've started using this thing called Basecamp, which I don't completely understand, but it's a way of, of sharing information. Uh, and it's been hugely successful. And every CZO has people that are involved in Basecamp now uh, about talking about the, the network activities. Um, the Integrate undergrad course is being revised and it's being completed this summer. It should go live this fall. And if you're interested in more information about that, you should email Tim White. And uh, there's a Journal of Geosciences Education Manuscript about the course, which is already in review. And again, you can contact uh, Tim White about that. Uh, a letter of intent has been submitted last week to NSF uh, GP Impact. And this is all about improving undergrad education via, via CZ Science. Ongoing activities. Um, there's an AGI Earth Sciences Week activity, which has been published. It's the fifth one. Uh, there's a quarterly newsletter. And right now, 268 people receive it. Uh, we, I think every CZO is on Twitter. And one of the reasons I think that is I think that Shell Hills was one of the last ones to go on Twitter. Uh, I think we're also on Instagram. Uh, and you can see the number of followers. And so I'm sure that'll be going up because we've just come online to Twitter. Uh, there's a blog that, that's, Justin. that Justin's writing uh, called Adventures in CZ. So it's Justin Richardson, uh, a couple posts a month. There's a CZO YouTube channel, and there's a summer 26 teacher work that's planned. Uh, it was it was occurred in 2016. Um, it was the second one. Um, some upcoming activities: December 2016, Pennsylvania Science Teachers Association session. There's going to be a special issue of the National Earth Science Teacher Association Journal, the Earth Scientist, this fall. And then a video series, and we're particularly excited about this. This is with WGBH, um, and it's in the planning stages so of the first video that, video that would happen, I think, this fall. OK, um, the last key strategy for goal three is to explore new avenues to use AGU events, including the town hall. And um, this is where you know, we've got those first three transformative ideas that we're trying to get out there. And everybody's chomping at the bit to put more transformative ideas in the list. I mean, everybody's got nominations for the next three transformative ideas. And so Bill McDowell and I have been brainstorming, and this is sort of a balloon. But you know, maybe we could have nominations for the transformative CZ idea of the year. And then we could have voting or some, some way of selecting, and then invite a person to talk about it at the town hall at AGU each year. Um, again, this is a very, you know, raw idea that we're just playing around with. You know, how can we pick what we think of as the exciting ideas each year, and how could we highlight a speaker at the town hall? So that might be something we might want to talk about even on this on this uh, webinar. Uh, there's conversation about organizing a Chapman conference on extreme events. I think Lucia has been been uh, you know promoting that idea. And then, as always, we're always looking for critical zone themes at AGU meetings, uh, just like the ones I showed you uh, that Suzanne and I tried to push forward this year. All right, goal four. How am I doing on time here? 2.35. Oh, I'm not doing too badly, even though we messed around so much. OK, goal four. Articulate a compelling vision and structure for the future network of CZOs. OK. so. I think our funding ends, if I'm not mistaken, in 2018. And NSF has not told us whether they're going to put money on the table for the next five or 10 years for critical zone observatories. And so we feel it's in our best interest to think about what the future of CZO might look like. 
And so we would like to articulate a compelling vision and structure for the future network of CZOs. So we hope uh, to submit, maybe even this year, some kind of position paper to NSF that articulates alternative models for the future network of critical zone observatories. Um, we hope by the end of 2017 to engage the broader community to a set of big hypotheses about the critical zone that could be tested by a future network. And we hope by the end of 2017 to engage the broader community to explore alternative models and develop a recommended optimal structure for the future network. So this is kind of our vision, like we're, what we'd like to be able to do in this last goal. And here's some of the strategies. Um, I think if you hit the next, yeah. So, okay, so these first two are all about uh, publishing the existing common questions document as a starting point. Um, that's already, I believe, online on our website. And then develop a proposed list of key hypotheses about the critical zone that could be tested. And Bill Dietrich and Suzanne Anderson actually have been working on that. And um, I think, yeah, so here's a few possible hypotheses. This is kind of, again, trial balloon. Uh, the first one, critical zone architecture controls hydrologic and geochemical processes that drive concentration discharge relationships in rivers. You can see how that hypothesis directly maps on to our postdoc effort. I think the exciting work that Noah and Kieran are going to be doing with the postdoc is exactly about this hypothesis, and or at least uh, aspects of this hypothesis. And this also maps on to the special volume of water resources research, uh, which is uh, which uh, John Trover is accepting papers for up until the end of August. And apparently that's a hard deadline because I asked him if we could have a little bit extra leeway and he said no. <laughs> a second one, what controls the depth to fresh bedrock? I'm testing five different hypotheses. We'll see that on the next slide, but we're not going there yet. Third one, aspect differences can be used to reveal mechanisms linking critical zone structure, biota, and hydrologic processes. I think that one is crying out for a special issue or some kind of special focus, but I don't know that that's happening yet. Maybe I'll be told I'm wrong. Fourth one, deep microbial community is linked to vegetation. Microbial community will be distinctly different under agriculture fields, brush, grassland, perennial forest, and deciduous forest. I know there's a lot of activity in the microbial working group. I know that there's some samples that have been taken across the whole CZOs where they're going to make the measurements identically at each CZO in these samples. So I think that's, you know, there's going to be hypotheses in that microbial area that are, are uh, ripe for the testing. And the fifth one, deep critical zone architecture may control water availability to plants and microbial communities, which in turn will influence regional climate. So anyway, these are just sort of five hypotheses that, that kind of have been put up here. And then if we go back to number two, what controls the depth of fresh bedrock? Next slide. Here's five different uh, models or mechanisms that have been recently articulated that uh, control the depth to fresh bedrock. This does seem to be um, of interest to a lot of people within the CZO, and I think, you know, we're we're mapping out the structure, we're mapping out the depths of fresh bed rock, we're starting to know how that varies across landscapes with, within some of the CZOs, we're developing models that might be useful in predicting that depth of fresh bed rock, and then of course there's testing of the models against the data, and so we're really right there at the, at the cusp of that right now. The first one here is the frost weathering uh, idea the, in the Anderson et al. paper. And then the exciting work coming out of the YK group with James St. Clair and Steve Holbrook that are looking at uh, uh, the tendency for fractures to form uh, under hill slopes, experiencing uh, compressive stress. And then the papers that um, I've been working on, but there's other people that have been using uh, reactive transport modeling to predict chemical weathering fronts. Uh, then there's a new paper, Braun et al. in press, which uh, I can't even really talk about it yet because I haven't seen it. Uh, but that's talking about lateral flow and, and groundwater in terms of chemical erosion and how that impacts the depth of fresh bedrock. And then the paper with Daniel Rempe and Bill Dietrich with bottom-up control, where uh, the depth to fresh bedrock is, is basically controlled by the rate of drainage of groundwater through fresh bedrock. Uh, and, and it's tied to the rate of incision uh, in the nearby channel. So we think that 
this is a really good example of walking the path from sort of discovery and mapping to creating models um, and hypothesis testing. So the other thing that we want to do, and really this is going to be ongoing this fall, so uh, we're going to meet in September at Idaho, the PIs and um, some, some uh, participants from the different CZOs to visit the Idaho, to Reynolds Creek CZO. One of the things we're going to do there is really start grappling with this idea of what the future network of CZ science sites might look like. And this slide was made by Kitty Losey just to kind of show you what, you know, how you might think about it. I mean, maybe, maybe the future CZO network would be just like the current one. Maybe we would try to fill in the gaps. Uh, maybe we'd want to link uh, between sites with some uh, linkage, linkage CZOs. Maybe we'd want a hub and spoke kind of thing, or maybe there'd be satellite sites. We'd really like to grapple with this. And of course, it's not really about the network geometry. It's about the questions you're trying to answer, the models that you can test, the hypotheses that you can test, and which sort of uh, confirmation of a network is going to take you where you want to go um, into the next 10 years. And we'd like to think that, uh, you know, we've got a whiteboard and it's, it's really the time to really think out of the box and think with other communities. We're excited that there's this other community uh, of scientists um, that uh, just wrote a paper about taking the pulse of the Earth system in EOS. We're excited to have other members of other communities to join us in these kinds of conversations. This uh, network idea, I think, are these different ideas. We will start to articulate those more this fall, uh, maybe even presenting some ideas at the town hall in AGU. Um, we also are going to engage the broader community and especially design workshop in 2017 uh, to try to reach agreement on what are the, the big hypotheses and alternative models uh, that we should be testing into the future. Um, and then, you know, we want to write this up and make sure that we can get it out to the, to the community. And towards this end, um, I've been tasked with um, putting together a meeting for next summer. And we want it to be as close as possible to NSF because we're hoping to get as many people as we can from NSF to come. Um, we're, this will be an all-hands meeting, so as many people um, well, not as many, but we'll have some number of people from each CZO, and the number will be greater than two. Um, but we also want to have it open so that people that aren't within CZO can also come. That's what I meant by all hands and new hands. And um, Arlington, where NSF is, is very close to the Nature Conservancy. I would love to get some folks from the Conservancy there. It's not too far from USDA. I'd love to get some people from USDA and USGS and other entities. Um, we're hoping for something like 200 people, and I've been trying to price this up to see what we can do. You can see if we do it at the Arlington Hilton, which is actually almost contiguous with NSF, so that would be very close. Those are some of the dates that we're, we're actually looking at. Um, still 10 at this point, but that's, that's where we stand on that. And I think that we will get that nailed down real soon because venues in D.C. are going to disappear for next summer um, very quickly. Next slide. All right, so this is my last hand, my last hand, my last slide. Um, this was what we articulated in February as our strategic plan for the next three years. This is not set in stone. This is our vision for what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go. It's a living, breathing document, just like we're looking at the living skin of the earth. This is sort of our living document, and we need people to participate. Um, we need you to make questions right now, make suggestions. You can give feedback to the PI committee directly or through your lead PI. We need you to participate in meetings. We need you to publish, to engage, to pursue ideas, to energize the lead. Um, that's what NSF is looking for. They're in particular articulating that they want to see what the next generation scientists think. I think they're tired of some of the senior scientists in our group, and they've particularly emphasized that they want to have junior scientists um, at, at meetings, at NSF meetings. And in particular, we do have an NSF review of the CZO network that's going to happen in early November. I think it's the 14th and 15th. And each CZO is going to take a PI, but they're also one junior scientist who will be giving a talk there. 
And this is, was specifically requested by NSF because they really want to know not only what our ideas for the network of the future might look like and what critical zone science of the future might look like, but what the junior uh, scientists want it to look like. And then also what people that are outside of the CZO today want it to look like. So we hope to always be working with others outside of CZO and abroad. So that's what I have to say. I hope I did this justice. Um, I think what we are going to do now is, I don't know, are we going to open it up for everybody? Mm -hmm. We can try that and see how it works. Um, why don't we do that? Why don't we... Uh, And if you do have a question, why don't you put something in the chat box that you have a question, and I will call on you so that we kind of go one at a time. So please, please mute if you're not talking, but we've opened up all the, all the, everybody's going to have the ability to talk. So Mike, you have a question. Mike, do you want to articulate your question, Mike Gusev? Okay, he can't talk. So Mike's asking, will NSF be in the middle of their move during that time? Uh, according to Rich Yuritich, they will not. Um, he says that if we do it in June, we're fine. I don't exactly know when they're going to move. <laughs> I'm glad somebody else has operator errors too. Um, does anybody else have a question? Or does a, would a PI like to, another CZO PI, anybody want to log in? Say something? I could have messed up a description. Tim White, would you like to say anything about education and outreach? Okay, Tim White and Diana Carwin are typing. Let's see who types faster. Okay, Diana makes the point that we do have a CZO alumni network. I think what she's referring to is we have a group of um, sort of junior, we have a junior scientist group. Uh, they started out being a student group, but then a lot of them went on to faculty, mem to faculty positions. And that group has actually been very successful, both in their own careers, but also successful in helping us with the network. And uh, They've helped a lot with the uh, common measurements and kind of helping us organize and that sort of thing. And so it would be really brilliant if, the, if that group and the group of junior scientists that are coming to the NSF meeting in November actually kind of talked together and talked about the talks that they're going to give while they're at NSF and maybe even coordinated them so that they could be talks that almost work like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. In other words, you know, each speaker might have a particular focus for their talk that might have come out of the work that they've done. But maybe when you put all the pieces together, there would be some kind of message of, of kind of where we could be or where we should be going. Uh, and I think that will take some coordination and, you know, the, the junior scientist alumni group and or the group that's coming to NSF in, in uh, November uh, are really the people that, that could and should do that. Let's see if there's any other questions. Okay, Bill's got a question comment. We should emphasize that the strategic plan is a living document subject to periodic revision and updating. Yes, um, we wanted to write a document that would be short and bulleted, like uh, kind of what I went through here. And it is on our website. And we don't really want to go back and wordsmith it because it's kind of the snapshot of where we're going right now. But we don't want to think of it as a, as a set of handcuffs. Um, we're, we sh are going to be strategic planning again. We're going to be articulating where we're going and what we're doing again. Um, it is a living and breathing uh, process, even if we don't want to keep wordsmithing that particular document. OK, there's another question here. Um, yeah, Suzanne or Bob Anderson are asking, um, what kind of a network would people like to see after 2018? 
Maybe you could go back to the different networks, the picture that I had. Um, does anybody want to, uh, it, are people unable to talk? Is that why they're, okay. All right, so for some reason we're not enabling, we're not allowing people to talk or it isn't working, but um, what kind of a network would people look like, like this to be? Any thoughts on that? Paul Brooks, research between sites is quite valuable, both scientifically as well as demonstrating the ability not to fight <laughs> only for our own sites. It would be great to quantify successful efforts across two or more locations. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, Paul. I mean, I think what Paul is suggesting is that there are probably many uh, collaborations and we, that are just pairwise or maybe, you know, three CZO collaborations. And maybe we should make some sort of effort to, to collate all of them to show, even in diagrammatic form, all the different collaborations that have occurred. Because I think that's one of the exciting things is how much more we are talking to one another and even working together. So Diane is writing something about a new-ish white paper. I'm not sure if she means the alumni group is writing a new white paper or whether they should write a new white paper. It sounds good either way. Okay, here's one. Adam Wymore, what happened? The chats just went away. Gosh, technology is defeating us here. One of the hosts took the chat box off. We're looking for the chat box. <laughs> McDowell, Bill, you raised your hand. How nice. <laughs> Yeah, we can't we can't see the chat box now, and we're, I don't know what's what's happening. We are attempting to find where it went. Oh, hooray. <laughs> Did you lose a little few pounds there trying yeah. to find it? Uh -huh. um, Adam Weimar is leading a paper that highlights the progress and need for international collaboration um, for earlier career people, maybe. That's great. Um, what do you guys think about this idea of nominating idea of the year or something like that and then having a speaker that talks about that idea at the town hall each year Mike's typing. Allison Anders is typing. <laughs> you know, you may not know this, but Sarah Sharkey works here with Tim White, and she's running this, and she is working really hard to try to make this work. Multiple attendees are typing. It will probably bring down the chat room. <laughs> You're doing a great job, Sarah.
I'm serious that the junior scientists that are going to NSF for this meeting, we really need to get you guys together and think about how you can make talks that kind of give NSF a message. Okay, here's a couple of chats. Okay, I'm a little concerned that idea of the year might not reinforce inclusivity of CZ science outside of CZOs. That is a great comment. Um, we would have to do it, in my opinion, in a way that would allow people outside of CZO to nominate and vote also. So it would, you know, this is a very raw idea. It may be a very bad idea. Many of our ideas are bad. Um, but there might be some way to do it, you know, with Survey Monkey or so, I don't know, where, where it wouldn't matter if you're inside or outside CZO. Okay, let's see what Mike wrote. With respect to what a future network should look like, I wonder how much NSF will want to dictate that. We see this with LTER i.e. they'll have an RFP for a new ARID site, etc. A proposal from the current network about different flavors of CZOs that are not represented would be great. Yeah, that would be like fill in the gap. Um, you know, the idea that we don't have an Arctic CZO, for example, or we don't have an urban CZO. And I agree with you, Mike. We, we don't know what NSF is going to want. Um, we don't know whether they would ignore what we said or um, be excited about what we said. But I think the exercise of thinking about what the community would like uh, the future of CZ science to look, look like, uh, what a network might look like, I think that exercise would be a really good one for us to do. And I don't know, I'm a Pollyanna. I always believe that if you think of a good idea and articulate it well enough, maybe, maybe it could happen. Here's Suzanne or Bob. I've heard multiple queries about why there isn't an Arctic CZO. Of course, the current CZOs were selected by NSF on the basis of proposals. Right. I think there would be, I think a lot of people could, could get excited about the fill in the gap idea because there are, there are obviously CZOs that are missing. Uh, Mike's in the Arctic right now. I'll tell you what, Mike, it is about 100 degrees and 2% humidity here in central PA. Coastal plain CZO. Everybody's got now going to put in their most favorite site for a CZO. Multiple attendees. <laughs> We can see at least who's the fast typers. Let's see. Uh, Jill Marshall, in terms of filling in the gaps, it's an excellent opportunity to work with international partners. Well, I'll tell you what, Tim White and Sarah have worked very hard to try to compile all the different CZOs or CZO-like uh, you know, settings around the world that are under study and collate those in a way that attributes are compiled and noted. And uh, that's something that Tim has been very interested in promoting, just kind of putting out there, you know, more information and education about different kinds of sites that are available all around the world. All right, let's see what else is on here. Um, so Bill says, we should really work to link these potential new sites to NEON too. And again, there is a big effort to um, Tim White is working with Bill McDowell and um, Dan Richter to get more interaction between LTR and NEON and CZO. And, uh, you know, any kind of network growth or change or flowering or design opportunity, we, we would definitely need to be cognizant of NEON, LTER, and international sites. And Eve agrees with Bill. Okay, let's see. Here's another one. Top down or bottom up? Is the CZO network a resource to be joined or a structured design of field sites? Okay, that confuses me a little bit. I'm not sure. Resource to be joined or a structured design of field sites. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand if that's a question or an observation. Um, it's possible that Colin is getting at this question of are we running a facility? where you know, we have sites and everyone's supposed to you know, find money to come use our facility, or whether we're doing science. And I think there is a great tension in that respect in the CZO network. I think we like to think that we're trying to do both, but there is sort of a dynamic tension there. 
Okay, Colin's going to type in, explain to me how I misinterpreted what he wrote. I think I already said that one. <laughs> People all around the country that are typing. Mm -hmm. Oh. I got his intent. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, I, I think that that's always been a tension. I mean, I know we try to get, we try to, anybody that wants to work here, we try to get them at our, at our CZO at Shell Hills and other CZOs are the same way. Having said that, when we wrote our proposal, we said we'd do certain things, so we feel a tension that we have to do what we said we were going to do. And I think that's sort of an untention within the network and at each site. And it's something that we need to probably grapple with with NSF. There must be a long time lag between when people type things and put it in because either that or people are incredibly slow typers. I'm going to wait. It looked like a lot of people were typing, but they were at 3 o'clock, so this is probably as long as we're going to go. Um, on a note related to Colin's question, how do we define who is part of a CZO? That's a good question. Um, you know, probably you're writing that because throughout the talk I said inside or outside of CZO. I guess we kind of think of it as people that are getting CZO money versus people that aren't. But I know that here at our CZO, and I think this is true at every CZO, we have people all over campus that are working at our CZO. And we have people from all over the world that are working at our CZO, and they're, they're, they're not getting any money from us. So it does get to be difficult to define inside and outside CZO. I tell you what, the reason, one of the reasons we emphasize that so much, though, is that NSF is always criticizing or getting criticism about, from some people who say that CZO is an insider's game. And I don't think there's a single person that gets money money within CZO who wants it to be an insider's game. I don't think there's a single CZO that doesn't want outsiders to come in. I don't think there's a single person in CZO that wouldn't like uh, other people to get funded and to work in the CZOs. I think we would very much like as much collaboration from outside as possible. But each of us, for example, that are each of the PIs, we, we feel responsibility, we wrote a proposal with people for an RFP, and we said we were going to do certain things, and so we've got to use our money to do those things, and we can't willy-nilly take that money and do something else with it, because then when we get, if we get uh, reviewed, you know, we won't be able to, we won't be able to get, to get renewed or, or to keep it going. So, there's just this kind of tension between getting people in, working at the CZOs, and, and making things happen. And I, I think everybody would like more people to be involved, and we'd like to find ways to do that. And we would love it if the community just kept demanding of NSF that, that they find ways to, to get people to work at the CZOs. I think that the tremendous success of the geophysical work that Steve Holbrook and um, the people in YKEG uh, achieved really shows that if you have a hammer and you move it across all the different CZOs, that is one model for making exciting science happen. And so I hope that model will get noticed uh, by other scientists and that proposals get written like that, um, saying we want to do this at all the CZOs, for example. And I hope it'll get noticed at NSF that that, that allows uh, great things to happen. Um, We've been real excited about the science paper that James St. Clair um, and Holbrook and, and various other people wrote. Let's see what else is here. Um, as opposed to thinking about a domain or environment that is missing, can we reframe the issue of network design by revisiting the key critical
investment. address by another Network. Rather than an individual. Follow that. Up with what subset of LTERs and neon sites best enable leverage addressing those questions? Yeah, I agree with that entirely. The reason I put that slide that Kitty made up that showed all the different types of network is to get us away from the idea that we're just trying to fill in the gap. I mean, that, that is a viable way to move forward, and I'm not saying I don't agree with that, but I think that, you know, thinking about other formulations of a network that would answer specific questions, which is what Paul's arguing, that would be have a lot of utility. Um, and then I think the one thing that we should probably do that we didn't do when we first got started in this whole game is we should think about the way NSF does things. So just to remind you, when we first got started on this, we articulated that we, we needed some observatories. And we thought that there should be some observatories that get a lot of resources and have a lot of instrumentation, and that there would be satellites um, off of those big observatories that would get less resources and less instrumentation. And those satellite sites might cross you know, gradients and climate or something. Um, and that was our vision, kind of a network with satellites. That was our vision of what it, what it should look like. But then when NSF writes an RFP, they don't write an RFP for a network. They write an RFP for sites. And so that's where the conceptualization of the network falls apart, because they don't write an RFP for a network. They write it for sites. And then people, you know, whoever writes the best proposals, 
emerge and that's the network we end up with. That's why we have the network that we have today. And that, from a very pragmatic point of view, I think we have to think about that a little bit and, and think about, okay, given the fact that it's unlikely, I guess, that NSF would ever write an RFP for a network, given that that's probably not going to happen, what should we do given that situation? Or, you know, maybe we should just demand a network, which would be a huge RFP. Let's see what else other people have written here. Paul, I struggle with the question of how to compare IML with other sites because it seems like the IML is a totally different beast than the other sites. I agree that it could be very powerful to think about how to integrate across the sites we have. It's just been a huge challenge for me to get much traction on this. Well, Allison, that's, you're, you're not the only one, but I mean, there are, there are some techniques that can be done at every site. For example, the soil microbiology team, as I understand it, is doing a whole bunch of uh, metagenomic analyses on a sample from each CZO and is going to try to, to use that. So I think there are probably ways we could do this. But again, we got to be smart. Let's see what Eve says. Regarding the transformational CZO science of the future, could each CZO contribute some amount of funds to a RFP that is issued to CZ scientists and others? The successful PI would get to give a talk and get a small award to start the research. Each CZO contributes some amount of funds to an RFP that is issued to CZ scientists and others. Well, that's an interesting idea. I kind of think we should riff on that one a little bit. Um, I will say that getting the CZOs to agree to contribute money to fund the postdoc was extremely um, time consuming and difficult. So sharing money is a little bit hard, but there might be ways to do something like that, Eve. That would be good to, to think about. Suzanne or Bob writes, one strength of individual sites is the longevity of monitoring data in the context for other measurements. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, one thing that's happening is we are getting long data sets. I mean, I, I think one thing that we haven't done very well is articulate what we are doing with observatories that, that you can't do in the three to five year um, single PI or double PI NSF grants. And I guess I would like to hazard that it's the process-oriented science that we're doing at these sites. Um, you know, if you want to test one particular thing, one particular phenomenon, our CZOs might not be the, the best place to do it. Like if you want to understand super fast erosion, you know, maybe the best place in the world to go is Taiwan or somewhere. Maybe it's not one of our CZOs. But on the other hand, if you really want to understand something from a sort of a process-oriented point of view, that's where the observatories come in. And I think we need to articulate that more clearly, like what it is we're doing in observatory science that you can't do in the single and double PI grants. OK, I'll take a couple more um, comments in the chat box, and then I think we'll close it up. This, this uh, presentation was for people that are inside CZO uh, just to kind of just be an advertisement for what we did at our strategic planning exercise. Um, it wasn't meant to exclude people from the outside, but it really was just talking to people that are already working at the CZOs, and we thought that uh, we really wanted to get that information out. Colin, are you still typing? I was waiting for yours. Oh, Suzanne wants to know if the PowerPoint will be made available. The answer is yes. We'll put it on the website somewhere. Suzanne, you're kind of in charge of the website, so you can, you can type in and tell people where it's going to be on the website. Colin writes, on data management, some of us data managers have been discussing a project to capture metadata.